Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hey, all you avid listeners out there, this is Dr. John. And if you enjoy what you're hearing on these joint podcasts with me and my fiance, Jory Rose, please know that we are offering a week-long retreat in Costa Rica in April of 2023 at one of the top resorts in the country where the body workers are next level and you will learn from myself and Jory how to be in better relationship to yourself, to your loved one, and to everyone else. This is going to be a once in a lifetime experience. Please feel free to check out the podcast notes for more links, details, and info. Thanks so much. And now on with the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another awesome conversation joint episode. I am Jory Rose and here with my fiance, Dr. John. And we are here with the Journey Forward with Jory Rose podcast and the Evolved Caveman podcast. And we are um, sharing some exciting news, I think possibly for the first time really publicly with you guys right now, is that we have secured a retreat in Costa Rica for April of 2023. And we are super excited. And what we're going to be talking about today is highlighting the very things that we want to be delving into for that retreat, which is all about how to be in better relationship, both to yourself and to others, could be a romantic partner, could be children, coworkers, families. That, of course, you know, John and I focus a lot on romantic relationship conversations as we do our work together and, of course, being in relationship together. But these tools are going to be beneficial regardless of the actual relationship. So I hope that you are going to get excited based on what you're going to hear. I know we're super excited to be able to bring these tools in this conversation to you. And hope this is inspiration for you to join us in Costa Rica. And of course, there will be lots of information. Go to the show notes. There will be a link. You can have access to all the um, juicy details and be able to look at the retreat location and all of the exciting offers that are to come. But let's jump right in. So, John, I was suggesting that maybe for this conversation, we start talking a little bit about the work you and I have each done individually that we know has contributed to our relationship feeling really whole and complete and fulfilling and thriving and resilient. Because we've often said we wouldn't have been ready for each other 10 years ago. Yeah, I I don't think we would have been a good match. We we weren't, well, I want to say we weren't fully cooked. I'm not sure we're fully cooked now. We're still growing and learning. We weren't as evolved. We were were barely on the beginning of that. And no one's ever fully arrived, like you said. I mean, we are still always doing the work. And it's funny, I think that divorce is a huge gift in that way, right? It's a wake-up call midlife where you're like, oh, shit, maybe maybe there are some things I still need to work on. And it it really knocks you out of your complacency. <laughs> I think it's not just maybe, oh, shit, there are things I have to keep working on. <laughs> yeah. So you, you recently really vulnerably shared on Facebook a, a big piece of your story and your journey. And I know I've told you, <clears throat> I've told you this many times, but this story is so powerful. <clears throat> Excuse me, I get smarter. This it's story so, powerful, so powerful, it chokes you up. <laughs> it does, literally. I can't find the words. Um, because the, the, what you shared on social media, again, so eloquently and so beautifully highlighted, literally all the work that you've done on yourself. And to me, that is such an attractive quality. And it allows you to feel whole and healed and literally putting all the tools you teach into practice like daily. So would you mind sharing? And then I'll go in and and I'll share some of my stuff as well. Sure. Um, And I don't even think it's all the work that I've done. It's just some of the work and it's some of the benefits of the work, I guess, or some of the work in progress. But many of you listening may not know that I've been blind in my right eye for about seven years. Um, and, and it was, it was a, it was a huge problem. Honestly, um, when I saw clients, I wouldn't see one client at a time. I would see three. So if they're sitting about six feet away from me, I would actually see three floating heads. Um, so I wasn't fully blind. I was, it was like looking through the bottle of an empty Coke bottle. 
um, when they would give me the eye exams at the eye doctor, the optometrist, they would put up the, the letters to say, you know, what letters can you see? And I would say, I can't see any. And they would dial it back, back, back till there's just the big E in the white square, the white rectangle on the wall. All I could see was the white rectangle. And even that was amorphous, like it was misshapen. And so it, it really impacted my ability to read. It really impacted my ability to write. It really impacted my ability to, to concentrate. Like I had to work on appearing normal in my facial expressions when inside I was slightly uneasy because I couldn't see the emotional expressions on my client's face. Hmm. And it was... Which is ironically something you had been trained in doing a little bit more with studying yeah. micro expressions. Yeah, I loved it. And now it was that was taken from me. But anyways, the, the way this happened was about seven years ago, it was the, so it was New Year's Eve. And I was home with my daughter who was eight, turning nine the next day. Um, no, I guess she turned, so it was December 30th. She turned on December 31st. Is that right? No, December 31st, it was gonna, yeah, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> and my son, who was young, he was in his early teens, came home and we had struggled with him most of his life. Um, he just didn't want to put forth effort in most areas of life. He got into drugs early. Um, he would sneak out at night. Um, he, he was problematic, which, well, I won't go into that, but, um, and so he came home noticeably wasted and I thought, well, I'm not going to do anything right now. I'll, I'll talk to him in the morning when he's sobered up. So in the morning, I just went into his bedroom and said, Hey, I need you to give me your phone. Um, I don't appreciate you coming home wasted. That's breaking the, the rules. And the rule is you give up your phone when that happens. And as most drug addicted people do in that situation, they get indignant and they argue back and they start to attack. And he got enraged and threw the phone at the wall. And I was like, which I never really got that. You know, why do you th throw your own phone against the wall? But anyway, um, anger, I guess. So things escalated. I told him, you know, look, you're welcome to leave. There's the door. And I'm just trying to keep things kind of calm enough to get him out of the house. And eventually he came at me for his phone. And in the struggle, I caught a finger in my right eye. And immediately I lost the bottom half of my field of sight. And I kind of picked him up by the scruff of the neck and just forced him out the door, him in his backpack and said, you need to go find somewhere else. And so it's New Year's Eve and I couldn't get in to see a specialist right away. And if you're ever in a similar situation, I now know, go to the ER. Like the time of this is time is of the essence. And you only have about a two week window before you completely lose your sight because your retina, it was a retinal detachment and the retina is continuing to tear when you're just sitting doing nothing. So I went to an optometrist, I think a day later, they said, what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing this afternoon? And I said, I don't know. And they said, we know you're going to a ophthalmology specialist, someone that specializes in torn retinas. Okay. Went to see that specialist. He said, what are you doing tomorrow morning? I said, I don't know. He said, I do. You're going to have emergency surgery. I was like, oh, okay. And in the meantime, my, my field of vision was gradually growing smaller and smaller. So it went from 50% to 60% to 70%, 80%. And by the time I saw the specialist, I could only see a thin sliver at the top of my eye. And it was like a crescent. Um, and so that was interesting because I had to practice mindfulness during the nights to calm myself to even have a chance of going to sleep. Because I'm like, shit, I'm going blind. Like I'm losing my sight as we speak. Combined and it was with terrifying. all the other combined with all the other emotions within Yeah. Oh yeah, not even dealing with what yeah. was going on with my son yeah. and the trauma to my daughter and all that stuff. So by the time I got in, I had suffered a 90% retinal tear. Um, the odds of surgery were 70%. This will have no impact on your sight. 25%, you'll have a slight improvement, and 5%, you lose your eye. I was like, <laughs> None of those sound like great odds all right, let, let's do it. Um, and so, you know, the surgery was, was pretty frightening. And they, I mean, the first time they explained it to me, like I, my knees got weak. I got a little nauseous and lightheaded because what they were saying is they're going to pull the eyeball out, cut it open, insert a bubble, a gas bubble into it. 
and kind of smooth out the retina and your eye is going to fill up with blood. And then you need to lay face down facing the floor for a week so that the gas bubble can rise to the top of the back of the eye and adhere the retina to the back of the eye again. And then I also got a scleral buckle put around it, which is like a silicon band kind of permanently adhered to the back of my eyeball. I don't know who comes up with this stuff. Originally, out of an that. alien movie, right? Like, and, and by the way, I did wake up in the out. middle of that surgery and I was like, um, I'm awake. Can, can someone up the, the anesthesia? I don't really want to be oh, awake for this. God. Um, so, you know, after the surgery, I came home, my ex-wife, I, I don't know if she didn't understand or didn't get, didn't care, but she dropped off my son and my daughter two hours after surgery. And I was like, um, I'm supposed to lay face down for a week. And she was like, I'm sure you'll be able to deal with it. I was like, oh, okay, thanks. So I wasn't really able to lay down like I should have. So the, the, the healing didn't really work very well. And so, as I said, after surgery, I was kind of functionally blind. Um, and you know, I adapted, I, I had no peripheral vision on my right side, which was great fun for you and my daughter in the car. Cause you could, Oh yeah. You know, I could make all make faces and faces. show me the number one finger. And, Oh yeah. Um, he, could, he could never tell what I was doing. <laughs> and in, and, and in it, the passenger you know, seat. I, I had no detail. So driving, I can't see road signs, but you know, fortunately you can drive with one eye. So God bless the little things. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I think I went a year after that, kept seeing the specialist. You know, I kind of got, I could see fully, but I couldn't see any detail. Like it was all wavy and it, it was kind of useless. So we did it again. And we did the same surgery minus the scleral buckle, um, laid down for a week looking at the floor. And it, you know, Laying, looking at carpeting for a week, you really get into carpeting, you know, the, <laughs> just the kind of images that come and go. And so all the, all the while this was going on, I was practicing visualization and, and I was also practicing forgiveness towards my son. Um, so I'm, the way I visualized was I, you know, the minions from the despicable me movie, actually there's mm -hmm. a new one coming out soon. I pictured those guys, little yellow pill shaped guys and blue overalls in my eyeball with like spatulas and shovels. And so some of them were kind of with the shovel chipping away at scar tissue and carrying it out. Um, I imagine via the lymphatic system, but I'm not sure that's accurate, but Maybe that's why you sweat so much. Yeah. It's, ex it's exuding the waste. <laughs> um, thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate that. <laughs> He doesn't At least you accept you. it. He doesn't sweat um, you sparkles. <laughs> I glisten. So I, the guys with spatulas were smoothing the retina on the back of the eye. And if you know, if you don't know, there's a kind of a, a trough in the center of the eye in the middle of the retina. And that's where the focus really comes in. And so they would work on smoothing out that trough and making it clear and viable again. The little what happens in when you have your a, visualization. Yeah. When you have a retinal yeah. detachment, the retina gets um, kind of wavy, like you're trying to relay saran wrap. It's kind of the consistency mm. of saran wrap. So I just imagine them working to smooth the whole thing out. Well, it, you know, nothing really happened. And I just kind of chalked it up to, I was in that percentage where it kind of saved my vision, but kind of didn't. Um, and I had a third surgery, which you took me to a couple of years well, later. Where can, they had I, can I just inter interject in the, in, in the just as a timeline, I met you sometime after the second surgery. And, yes. and so I had, I, I was really uh, amazed at the power to which you were able to continually practice forgiveness, right? And forgiveness as being a way to dial down anger and to hold resentment, knowing that that's not, you know, holding on to those are only going to actually punish you, right? It doesn't yeah. change the outcome. It doesn't affect the other person um, generally as much as we would like to hope. <laughs> and I, I was always really impressed and in a lot of compassion for the journey up to that point so far, but really just thought, wow, like what a beautiful ability to, 
actually put these tools to use. And that was such an attractive quality, right? It well, wasn't thanks. about, you're very welcome. I mean, it wasn't like, oh shit, you know, dwell on what happened. No, like look at the process that he goes through of, of forgiveness and loving kindness, right? And so that's yeah. when I had met you. And I just thought like, wow, that's hot. <laughs> well, and now, you know, the forgiveness came about from meeting Fred Luskin, who was the forgiveness of the Stanford Forgiveness Project way back when I was doing the radio show, like in 2015. Was that 2015? No, no 2005. Yeah, I met you in um, 2015. 2006. And I read his book, interviewed him, and was really taken with this idea that forgiveness isn't done to approve or disprove of what someone did to you. It doesn't mean you condone what they did. It largely, if only, has to do with it's the best way to get rid of your old stale anger that you've been sitting on forever because we feel it's some magical level of thinking that by holding on to that anger, we're going to get back at that person or yeah. that it protects us from it happening again. Which just and keeps the energy so, alive, right? Right. And it just weighs you down. It's like putting big rocks in your backpack and walking around every day of your life. And so I've, I've practiced forgiveness as a daily practice since about 2006, 2000, well, no, no, probably since about 2010, when I started going through separation and divorce. Um, and I really had to practice it strongly with my wife, now my ex-wife, and really had to practice it daily with my son around this yeah. incident and, and other stuff that he had done. Um, and I found it's just the best way to let go of the anger. And then along with what you mentioned, the loving kindness practice where, you know, I would, I still do. I, I will, if people are frustrating me or making me mad, I will wish them well. So may you yeah. be happy, may you be healthy, may you live life with ease and well being. And it may or may not do anything for them. It, and it probably won't change their behavior. But what it does for me is it calms my physiology down in the moment. And yeah. sometimes if they're empathetic, they pick up on that and they calm down too. Right. But it's, it's, right. those are two of the most powerful tools that I've practiced over the years. Yeah. Um, so you were leading right, so right up to your third surgery. I drove you to. Third surgery. Um, so I got uh, a new lens put in my eye. Um, and. Well, you got to you got to uh, share the little bit of information. That yeah. Okay. So I had to get a new cornea began. because of the first surgery. Uh, it kind of screws up the cornea. So they said, "Come on in. We'll do outpatient surgery. We'll put a new cornea in your eyes." Like, all right, great. So they said, "Don't eat anything the morning before." And I was like, "All right, great." So I had coffee with some creamer in it because I don't like black coffee. And I get in there in the morning, and they're like, "Did you eat anything today?" And I said, "No, I didn't." And they said, did you drink anything? And I said, I had some coffee, which you said was fine. And they said, did you have anything in the coffee? And I said, creamer? <laughs> and they were like, uh, oh shit, hold on, doctor? And they came back and they were like, um, we can't give you any, any anesthesia because you had cream in your coffee. I like, it I wasn't remember, very much cream. It was drops. I, yeah, I know how you drink coffee. You barely have, you have, you have more coffee with your creamer than you do creamer with your coffee. I remember being in the waiting room and you texted me and you're like, I don't want to have to come back. So I'm going into this eye surgery with no anesthesia. Wish me well. <laughs> Send me some good thoughts. And I'm like, holy shit. Well, I do know he's got a loving kindness practice going. So he better pull on that right now. <laughs> yeah. I've never been so hard. So it, well, and it's interesting. They gave me the choice of reschedule or do it without anesthesia. And I was like, well, I, I don't really want to do it. I don't want to come back. So let's just get it done. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, 15 years ago, I couldn't touch my eye with my finger. Now I'm saying, yeah, go ahead, put a knife to my eye without anesthesia. I'm fine. Um, and it, it was fascinating because, you know, they, they tape your head to a, the board that you're laying on because you have to stay perfectly still while they're making the incision and doing the work. So I'm, I'm taped to the board. I have to look at what they're doing because... I can't close my you're eyes. You're awake, yeah. And, and awake. <laughs> so I'm I'm watching the scalpel come down towards my eye, and I'm just practicing mindfulness, yeah, and focusing on my breath and telling myself, "I got this. I can do this. This isn't that big of a deal." And and it actually worked. It was like a 15 minute surgery. Um, they went in, they pulverized the cornea, the lens in there, and then they inserted a new one, and. Then 
I was good to go in half an hour or so. Yeah. What a badass. And so <laughs> I was pretty proud of it, honestly. I was like, you, that was, you that, know, that's kind of amazing. That was complete spiritual um, badass. Not to have right too much there. pride there, but. Um, no, you, you, I think you've earned the pride there, love. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's, here's where the story gets really. I, I don't even know the word to put on it. Miraculous, crazy, amazing. If, as if that wasn't amazing enough. Um, so I continued to do the visualization practice because I really like the minions. They make me laugh. A lot of things. Make and, me that, laugh, and that but, corneal surgery, that was probably like 2016 or so, right? I mean, that was fairly uh, early 17, on in our yeah. 17. Okay. Yeah. But still pretty early on. We'd only been dating maybe a little over a year or so. Yeah. And so at night I just continued doing this visualization practice. You know, I probably spend five or 10 minutes most nights, not all nights, but most nights. Cause I thought, what the hell I've heard of visualization practices resulting in healing before. I, I don't, it can't hurt was my thought. Um, I knew the structure of the eye pretty well at this point. So I knew kind of what the goal was. So I just kept picturing these little minions working in my eye, smoothing things out, taking away scar tissue. So I kept going to the optometrist every year and every year I would see nothing you know, the big black wobbly wavy rectangle. And I went back recently and this was about two weeks ago. And I, the eye doctor said, I know, I think I can do something with this after he had used the machine that looked into my eyes. And I was like, really? And he covered the left eye and he put the machine over your nose that, you know, you, they can click the mm -hmm. little lenses, different lenses into place. Camera one, like, camera two. Camera one? Yeah. Yeah. What's better? better? One or two? What's better? <laughs> one or two? And he put a lens in place and I was like, oh my God, like I can see some letters. Now Amazing. I hadn't seen letters in seven years. Wow. And, and he's like, can you read these letters? And I was like, yeah, yeah I don't know what they were. B-E-L-K. And then he goes, can you read these letters? And he went smaller letters. I was like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And he went smaller. I went blah, 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 blah. We went all the way down to 2040 vision in my right eye. And for those of you who don't know, 2020 is normal vision. Now, I got to say that the, the letters are still not as clear as they used to be when I was younger, but I can read them. I can see them. Whereas before, yeah. keep in mind, all I could see was a wavy white rectangle. Now, yeah. I don't know if that was time that did that. I don't know if that was the visualization. I don't know if it was both but something dramatically changed. And now I've got 20, 40 vision and my brain's still kind of trying to make sense of the uh, sensory data coming in through my right eye. So I think it's still kind of catching up, which happened when I lost the vision. Um, but the brain right. is remarkably adaptive and can do some crazy things with different sensory data. I mean, we know that like they've done experiments where they've brought sensory data in through the uh, channel of taste. Mm. And so they've, they, it doesn't matter what route the information gets to the brain, the brain can interpret it, which is pretty wild. It's fascinating. John, this is, I mean, I remember that day. It, it, it does feel like a miracle. It does feel I, that's like the a word miracle. That's it comes to and, mind. I, I'm reluctant and, to put that on it, but. Well, and, it, you know, through the lens, no pun intended, that I see you with it feels that you were an active, persistent, ongoing participant in your own healing. Yeah. And I think that's incredibly important. And I think most people would stay in resignation and, you know, say, why bother? Or they would, you know, maybe start the path of visualization or loving kindness or forgiveness and say, I'm not seeing anything change. So why bother keep doing this? And I mean, talk about consistency is key when you're having no data to show you that it's benefiting anything. I mean, it, it really is an incredible story Thanks. on so many levels. So incredible. Well, And let me, let me, let me finish up real quick. Cause I've got yeah. this question a lot when I told this story before. So my relationship with my son is solid. Uh, we get along well, we talk regularly. He's working on his sobriety and I got to tell everyone I, he was crying when I told him this story. Yeah. He was so relieved. He's felt so shitty about it for so long. And to have that news, I think was relieving. I didn't know how big the weight was on him. 
actually. You know, it's an interesting thing, and I'm saying this in real time as we record this. You said he's working on his sobriety. It would be really interesting to see if there's any shift in the course of his path moving forward now, now that he can relieve some of the perhaps guilt or shame he was feeling as a result of causing you blindness in one eye. And it'll be fascinating because I think, again, when we look at all of this, right, it's how are we getting in our own ways of our own healing and our own journey? Where are we getting stuck? What are the things that are holding us back or moving us forward? And part of the reason I want to have you share this story as an entree into how to be in better relationship because it all starts with us, right? And we Mm -hmm. all have the points of our journey. We all have the parts of ourselves that we're not proud of, but that we wish we could do over or say, if I knew better, I would have done better. And yet we don't often do the work and then wonder, why are my relationships not healthy? Why am I not fulfilled? And, you know, I, I love that you and I both individually are always doing our own self work and it makes our relationship so rich and so full and fulfilling and authentic. And yet we can come together as two whole people. Like, I don't need to rescue you out of that pain. If I'm stuck in something, you don't need to rescue me out of it, but we can hold space for each other in love and compassion. And I'm not going anywhere, right? So I can hold this because what you're going through doesn't have to alter my course because I'm confident in myself. Right. And it doesn't have the negative impact that I know we see so much of our clients. Well, and I think the extension of what you're saying is we've we're doing our own individual work and we do work together as a couple. Yes. Because I think we're also almost always working on tools, communication, checking back in with each other. Always um, resolving revisiting resentments, hurts, annoyances. Yeah. And we've gotten much, much better at that over the years as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's a sign of just practice and building that muscle. But, you know, if you had chosen to not go into forgiveness and not go into loving kindness and would have stayed angry and bitter, I can guarantee you our relationship probably wouldn't have worked out. (laughs) Well, it's not very attractive, right? I mean, like who wants to be around someone that's mostly angry and bitter, which, so can I go to that story about yeah, yeah, what I was yeah. telling in that interview in Vegas? Yes, please. Yep. So someone asked me, the, the interviewer asked me, you know, did you ever have anger issues that you've had to deal with since you have helped so many people with anger management? And I said, well, it's interesting you ask that because I did. And, you know, if you look back at Inside Out, the movie, which I helped consult on, they, one of the things they made absolutely map onto neuroscience is this idea that we all have primary emotions or signature emotions, the one dominant emotion in our life at that moment. And if you look at, you know, Riley, when they go into Riley's head, joy was at the head of her remote control or her control panel in her mind. And then it gets all messed up because of puberty. And then the mom, the mom has sadness at her helm and the dad has anger at his helm. So those are their signature emotions. And they can change. And I think they do. I think the goal is for them to change throughout the lifetime that we have to deal with these uncomfortable emotions, more negative emotions, quote unquote, as we progress and evolve so that we can get to something like contentment. And in my life, I started out with sadness as my primary emotion, kind of getting slightly depressed here and there. Then when I was in my 20s, it shifted to fear and anxiety and panic attacks. And then towards the end of my marriage, it shifted to anger. And then once I got out of that, then I'm more at something like contentment and happiness. And so I told her that, you know, at the end of my marriage, my wife, now ex-wife, did accuse me of having an anger problem. And I thought, after I was annoyed by that, I thought, okay, well, <laughs> after, after me, it made you angry. <laughs> yeah, after it made me pissed. So, but then I was like, okay, let me let me look at that. If that's if that's my responsibility, I'll take responsibility for that. Period. Now. I do think there were other things going on that contributed to it because I don't consider myself an angry person, but she was right. There was times when I was angry and it was not helpful. And so I worked, I learned the tools, I practiced the tools and I got my anger managed. And as you know, forgiveness and loving kindness were a part of that. There's no well, and I would also argue it was, it was also situational. So right. Removing the situation. Right. Yeah. That and that's caused, what I'm saying. Right. Right. But I think that's, 
I love that concept of kind of evolving through these different signature emotions along the lifespan so that we can get to something like happiness more frequently. I don't yeah. think you're ever permanently going to be happy, kind of ebbs and flows. But, but but what you said you're at now is contentment. And I, I it's interesting that you're not, maybe not interesting. I feel that that's where I'm at in my life as well. And contentment, I think, is a really underestimated destination. Definitely. Contentment to me is the exact opposite of how I lived my early life when I was looking to what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next, because if I get to what's next, then I'll be happy, then I'll feel safe, then I'll be fulfilled, then I'll, you know, fill in the blank. And contentment is to say, you know what? I'm really good right here. And that's awesome. And I know there's going to be more of what's next, and that's going to be great too, but I'm not rushing to it. And people actually ask you and I this question all the time about why don't we live together? When are we getting married? And it's like, you know what? Right now, given the ages of our daughters and how soon it is till they graduate, right now, I'm really content with where things are. Does so let me ask you this. How would you describe contentment? Not needing to rush to what's next for happiness, joy, fulfillment. I would describe contentment for me as full, and I want to say authentic gratitude. And I put the authentic in before the gratitude, because I think it could be easy. I can look back at previous points in my life and say, I've got all these great things. I should be really happy and content here because of X, Y, or Z. And I'm talking like real authentic gratitude of, no, I, I feel whole and complete right now. I don't need something more to add to that sense of me feeling whole and complete or joy. How would you describe it? I agree. And I also, I describe it to clients as a less intense form of happiness. And, and I think, because I think in the West, we're always trying, we, we see happiness as a higher intensity, positive emotion, like an eight or nine on the 10 point scale. And so when we don't sustain that, we're disappointed. And to me, I'm looking at like a six on a 10 point scale as contentment where, you know, one through four is kind of more on the negative side. And I like the idea of if you ask yourself right here, right now, do I have everything that I need? Mm -hmm. Are my basic needs being met? And I can look around right now even and just be like, yeah, I've got clothes. I've got a fan or water or food. I got a roof over my head, a bed to sleep in. Yes, my needs are met. I am content. And, and I yeah. think that the more we can remind ourselves of that, the better off we are. Well, and it's about being present too, because I, you know, I think that's the attachment piece. When I have more of something, then I'll be happier. And like you said, happiness is fleeting and we want to be able to have a baseline that we're not trying to run from or run to. Yeah. And to that point, I think that a, a large part of this is realizing that all emotions exist for a reason to have a radical acceptance of all emotions in the moment. And, and I think, you know, go, looking back on the story with my eye and the, the fear that I was feeling at times um, and, you know, losing my vision, I think I just thought of it as, wow, this is going to make a really good story. So like I could mm-hmm. step back from the story, even in the midst of it. And I know that any story can be a good story as long as it elicits emotions in the mm-hmm. listener. Mm -hmm. And so even if it's a tough story, a hard story, it still can be a good story with some distance. And so I think that thought helps me to step back from my own life at difficult times and observe it rather than be in it. It creates more psychological distance. Yeah. And it helps you in the process be in better relationship to yourself. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, I think, you know, as, as all the clients that you and I both work with, people fundamentally don't know how to be in better relationship to themselves. Well, I'll speak for my client load. Um, you know, the majority of people I work with are women. And as a big, huge generalization, I often see women who get stuck in self-worth issues where their inner critic is really loud. They are stuck in comparison mind. They uh, don't feel worthy of achieving what they have or uh, believing to achieve what could be next to come in their lives. They worry about uh, not being enough, right? There's a lot of barriers that are standing in their way 
of living fully and freely and authentically because the story in their mind, their narrative, their past experiences have shaped them to not being in good relationship to themselves. And it impacts everything. Well, it's interesting. I mean, how could a female in this day and age feel that she is enough? Given the socialization process that everyone goes through, every female goes through, I mean, in terms of body image, in terms of physical beauty of the face, in terms of they're supposed to work and bring home money, they're supposed to be an excellent mom, they're supposed to, I mean, there, there's so many supposed tos that there's just not enough time and energy to do it all. Well, and then a lot of those supposed tos are opposites, you know, go out and be a contributing workforce member, but be a stay-at-home mom and take care of your kid. <laughs> like, yeah, or it, be, it, it be feels... emotionless at work and be warm and nurturing at home. Right. And so, you know, as I look at myself, because I, I was not always in great relationship to myself, I believed on my fears. I let those insecurities take over. I thought they defined me. And, you know, for my journey, it was getting into stillness because I was one of those women that as many women do stay busy, 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 because God forbid I should slow down for even just a minute. Then I have to sit with the emotion that arises and that's too uncomfortable. It's too scary. I don't know what to do with it. I can't make the circumstances change. And so if I just stay busy, then I won't have to face it. And there's a real big wake up call. And I've seen it with certain clients whose children are pending graduation and they realize that their definition of motherhood and the kind of role that they have been playing, especially for stay at home moms is going to begin to change. And this identity crisis then fear sets and oh shit, who am I going to be when I have got all this extra time? I don't know how to face myself. What's my life going to look like? And I jump started that process for myself many years before I ever hit that actual timeline barrier. But to be able to just to get still and be comfortable with being uncomfortable of what's coming up and learning to reconcile my thoughts are not my truth. I'm still dealing with this in this very moment. My thoughts are not my truth. Oh, look how quickly the narrative of fear arises. That's a choice to engage in that quality of thought, right? And recognizing the more I stay stuck in that, not only does it disconnect me from myself, but if I stay stuck in those narratives, guess what? It's going to disconnect me from you as my partner. Mm -hmm. It's going to disconnect me from my children when I am so stuck up inside my head. And so the very root of the healthy relationship starts with that internal relationship to self. What is the quality of presence, compassion, loving kindness, acceptance, non-attachment. I mean, you name it. It's, it's what I know you well, and I both teach me, and it's speak, what we both practice. Yeah. But, sorry to interrupt. Let me speak to that presence idea because, you know, you and I have no problem looking at each other's in each other's eyes. Mm -mm. And I think that's kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we'll do that as a potential exercise, like just look into your lover's eyes for a minute without speaking. And a lot of people have to turn away. And I think if you haven't done the work, if you're not completely authentic, if you're not kind of completely transparent with your partner, there's reason to look away mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it feels very revealing. And I think, you know, it, whether you're parenting, whether you're a leader at work, whether you're in a relationship at home, I love the saying time and attention are the currency of relationships. And it's all about presence, right? It's when I'm with you, Am I actually with you? Am I here with right. you, mind, body, and soul? Or am I thinking about shit that I have to do at work or right. the taxes that are coming up or the payment that's due next Wednesday? Because a lot of guys that I work with, I'm always trying to get them to be where they're at. Like if you have little kids, like put your phone away and be with your children. Yeah. Pay attention. It's the biggest gift you can give them. It doesn't matter so much the quantity of time you're giving them, what matters is the quality of time. A hundred percent. And going back to that eye gazing exercise, which is really hard to do. And like you said, you and I have no challenge in being able to do that. It makes me think of one of the quotes from Brene Brown's um, courage special she has on Netflix that came out a couple years ago. And what she said in there is we all want to be loved, but we're afraid to be seen. Mm -hmm. 
And that, that line always really struck me because to me, I think seeing somebody is the biggest gift you can give them, but people don't want to be seen if they can't see themselves, if they're stuck in something that if if it's really fearful and revealing, if someone can see you and you can't accept yourself. And I I recently was listening to um, a Brene Brown podcast and she and her sister talk about this. Actually, I've heard them say it a couple of times when their therapist will say something in which the therapist sees them and her sister gets very defensive. It's like, you don't know me. You know, yeah, that's like, the joke. You, 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 you don't know me. And then the response is, oh shit, you really do. Right. Yeah. And I have to get defensive at first because I haven't been able to sit with what you've just been able to see and reveal in me. Well, and that's why I love that simple, simple framework of, you know, when someone criticizes you, let's say in relationship and your first primal instinct is to get angry back at them. So the first response is, fuck you. Second response is, oh, I suck. And the third response is, wait, what? And I I think that's true for so many of us that we externalize our anger first, then we internalize our sadness, shame, self-loathing. And only then can we say, huh, no, they might have a point. Let me look at that. And to, to that very framework, and you in the beginning had said, you know, the power of you and I in relationship, going back and revisiting some of those past wounds early on, sometimes that three-step process can take years to get to that, yeah. wait, what? How, how did I contribute to that? Because I might have for years been stuck in the justification of my actions. And the wait, what? That's the vulnerable state. That's the, what is the co-creation that existed here? That is, how did I contribute to this? That I have to look at myself with humility and honesty to say, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I contributed to this. And, well, I'm sorry and one of the you. things I like about that is this idea of radical responsibility. Like, okay, wait, let me take radical responsibility for my part in that particular drama. And what is it that I need to look at? What is it that I might need to change or improve upon in order to make us more solid or in order to make you feel more safe and secure in our relationship. Yeah. And, and that's, that takes a little bit of work to get to. And it, and you know, this used to piss me off or in our relationship because I was like, shit, we teach this stuff. Why can't we get there yet? (laughs) And I know that was, you know, a dig at you. Like that would be hard because like I would get triggered by that. And we had to work through that. And I don't think you and I have been stuck there in a really long time. Yeah. But it's, it's also, it's emotion, right? I mean, that's the most primal level of our being. Mm-hmm. I would argue it's the most powerful. It's the fastest. It's been around millions of years. It's, I mean, I, I think of our conscious mind as kind of like Microsoft word 1.0, where our emotional <laughs> mind has been through millions of revisions. So right. it's fast, it's powerful. It can quickly take over. And that's really what we're trying to learn to manage and get a handle on. And so I I think to have self-compassion when it's not going real well, when you are making mistakes, when you are falling into emotional traps is incredibly important. And the number one thing that I would say is the key to practice to even know when you're stuck in that awareness, right? Self-compassionate awareness to say, Oh, look, there I go again. There there I'm traveling down that very familiar path that I know is going to only dig me a deeper hole and is not going to get me to where I want to be with myself or with whomever is in relationship important to me. So what yeah, would and you keep say? In mind, oh, pardon me. Let me just drop a stat in there that 95% of us think we're highly, we report we're highly self-aware when it's actually about 10 to 15%. So understand that most of us are probably not nearly as self-aware as we think we are. Okay, I'm going to challenge you on the spot. I've never asked you this question. I, 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 <laughs> I love that stat, but you're, you're always so good at remembering the stats. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. And okay, so 95% of us self-report as being self-aware. Compare that, juxtapose that to what your Cal professor said about taking things personally. Well, first share what your Cal professor has said about taking so, things yeah, personally. So yeah, and let's see my if we favorite, can juxtapose those two statements. Yeah, my one of my favorite professors at Cal in my PhD program. Uh, there was a couple, but my favorite professors were ones that had a foot in 
practice as well as academia. So they were grounded in both. And I remember I had a problem with it, someone I was consulting with, and she said something nasty to me. And I was like 25 and highly sensitive. And I was telling him about this. And he said, you know, John, I, I think most people make the mistake of taking 95% of what other people say, feel, and do personally, when in fact, it's about 5%. And that has stayed with me for 30 mm-hmm. years because mm-hmm. it's like, wait, am I taking this too personally? And I think depersonalization practice is such a big deal. Like what, just for those listening really quickly, what other interpretation can you come up with for that person's behavior that has nothing to do with you? And then let's say, tell you, Hey, I'm really pissed off because you did this, right. then take it personally. That's fine. And then hold on to the interpretation that serves you best. Exactly. But I'm but I'm curious. Line. I love that. Yeah. But I'm curious if the 95% of us are self-aware, self-reportedly, but then 95% of the time we're taking things personally. <laughs> where is it? Where you know, you would like to think if I'm being really self-aware, I wouldn't be over personalizing. But that's not self-aware. It's not self-aware right. to take something personally that has nothing to do with you. That's a mistake. Right. I just interesting with looking at the, the the habits of what we report ourselves to be and what we're actually doing. I guess that's what I was trying when, to bring in the comparison. Know, self-awareness from Tasha Yurik's research is, you know, there's two big parts to it. One is, are you aware of your own goals, aspirations, thoughts, emotions, behaviors? And the other part of it is, are you aware of your impact upon other people? Are you aware how other people perceive you? Mm-hmm. And, and so both of those factor into that. And those two don't typically go together. Like a lot of people right. have one or the other, not both. And the goal is to right. have both. Yeah. We never even got to the parts about being in better relationship to others. I think this, we, I love this conversation. It just delves so much into our own self-awareness and self-practices and tools to heal those wounded places in ourselves because Otherwise, if we don't do that own internal work, we often expect and hope or want or wish our partners to be able to heal those parts of us that we feel incomplete in. And then we know there's an imbalance in the relationship that puts, um, it it doesn't create for a lot of fulfillment and wholeness and true partnership. And so maybe we'll have to do another episode when we talk more about being able to better relationship with others, but yeah, I don't even think we got, we didn't get close. We didn't even get close. We touched on it. Do we, yeah, earlier, yeah. But, but I but I think this was a really important stepping stone to that next part because... I love it. Yeah, I love the talk. I don't think it's easy to do the external part until you've really gotten curious about the internal part, yeah. right? Because then, again, you're going to be placing too much expectation on your partner to make you content, to make you happy, to fulfill you. How can they fulfill you on the things they don't even know where you need fulfillment. And if you don't have, well, if you don't even know how you're time, feeling, what, what kind of shot do you have at a good relationship? Right. And I would say the majority of people out there don't know what they feel. Well, most, everybody... most men out there are denying that they feel right. And then or they can say, point... well, I feel good, good, sad. I'm happy, sad, or mad. Well, and they use that as a point of pride as a think of you yeah. know being in control of their emotions. But the impact of this, I think, is, you know, speaking to Brene Brown's new book, Atlas of the Heart, in which she was saying, you know, most emotion researchers have done it wrong, where they've tried to do the research so that way we can help understand other people. And what Brene Brown is currently suggesting is we can't understand others. And we've got to be able to focus on understanding ourselves and use that without a sense of understanding others from a point of assumption, seeing someone crying and saying to them, oh, you look so sad as a way of bypassing the hard work or the potential hard question to say, what are you feeling? What's going on for you right now? Yeah, I don't know that I believe that. Like, I'm not sure I agree with that completely in the sense that I think so many people out there are so emotionally restricted in their languaging that I think a lot of times it does make sense to try and take a shot at helping them to label the emotions as a jumping off point for the conversation, especially young kids. Well, I think the difference is for me, as I interpret that, it's making an assumption of you look so, like, you know, assuming from your own lens. Versus asking a question, I'm wondering if you're feeling sad right now versus you look so sad. 
So to yeah. me that you look so sad is the assumption you, you know, you look really sad right now. Is that what you're feeling to me is not making the assumption. So I, I I'm being really nuanced on, I think how it's I still look. an assumption. Well, but it, one of them for me gives room for a question and yeah. gives room for the, no, other I think the question's say, a better approach. Definitely. Right. Right. But to the, the root of her work right now being, how can we know what anyone else is feeling if we don't have any insight into our own internal landscape to know what we're feeling? And ultimately, that's the pathway to deeper, more connected, more fulfilling relationships is through your own inner understanding. And, and I really believe, I truly believe after doing this work for 30 years, that emotional management, emotional awareness, those are the pathways to happiness. That if you don't have those skills, I, I mean, a lot of the men that I talk to don't even recognize when they're hit by a positive emotion. If we're not aware when we're in a positive emotional state, how the hell can we be happy? Yeah. And then we can't share joy with our partners. Mm -hmm. So this is just a little tidbit of a lot of exciting information, content, exercises, practices that we are going to share. Uh, just to talk a little bit about it, the retreat center is awesome. It's called Pure Amazing. Well, uh, and the yeah, body workers I, are next level. This, I mean, talk about a healing resort. It is one of those places that you think you're going in for a massage and you're coming out with healing beyond what you could imagine that your tight muscles, it wasn't just about the muscles. Yeah, it's, it does feel kind of mystical. It's interesting. It does. It does. And Pure Vita is, also awesome because it's really easy to get to. Some of the places in Costa Rica can, can be really hard. And it's like a 15-minute shuttle ride from uh, San Jose Airport. And they also offer a ton of really fun excursions like zip lining in the cloud forest and river we rafting. River rafting at one of the top um places, I think in the whole country to, to yeah, go it was to awesome. level five river rafting. You did that one, I didn't. I've been there twice. We were there once together. Um coffee plantation. I mean, there, there's some Tour, really yeah. off, awesome excursions. So it's going to be a phenomenal week. And the dates are April 22nd through 29th, 2023. So that is just under an entire year from now. So plenty of time to plan. Wait, Jory, do I have to be in a relationship to go? No, John, good question. You do Thank not. You. This is for anyone who wants to have an experiential practice in both a really supportive and compassionate environment while meeting other like-minded people, while offering ability for amazing excursions and amazing uh, healing opportunities through the, uh, the beautiful workers at this resort. Like it's going to be for anyone who wants to show up and know how to be in better relationships. To themselves first and foremost. Yeah. And, and that was one of the questions we got a lot. We, we had planned this retreat in the middle of COVID. Well, pre-COVID pre -COVID. We planned it, yeah. then COVID hit and we had to scuttle it. Um, so that was one of the questions that we got frequently. And at first it was going to be for couples. And then we realized, you know what, the tools that we teach aren't just for couples. They're for, for people who just want to be in better relationships, but it is limited in its spots. So um, we yeah, don't have very. a huge group so if this is of interest to you, check out the link in the show notes. And like I said, this conversation is, you know, just a tidbit of what we'll be de delving into and something that you can be given the opportunity to have some greater insight for yourself. Well, let me just, so if they don't go to the show notes for the link, can they just go to the ultimate relationship.com and drill down from there? Yes. Okay. Ultimate relationship.com, joryrose.com. And we'll make sure it is on your Evolved Man Cave, Caveman website. Evolved well. Caveman. Yeah, I don't have a man cave yet. <laughs> but that's coming. <laughs> Evolved Man Cave. Oh my God, there's your men's retreat right there. It's the Evolved yeah. Man Cave. Pool table, keg on tap. Meditation cushions. <laughs> Actually, to have like dry martinis on tap, that'd be better. <laughs> I think we just branded you a, a location. Vespers on tap. <laughs> Vespers. Uh, most evolved to drink. <laughs> Bond. James Bond. All right. This was awesome, love. Thank you for vulnerably sharing your story. I love you so much. You're most welcome. I love you too, baby. 
Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 